see the glass half full of nerd. If y'all see us moving different, don't ask no questions. Just know, God got us moving in a different direction. You heard? Cut our ways. Why you gotta move like that? Keep my cool. No, I can't never go back. Uh-uh, no way. New city, new place. New city, new place. Change. I've been up to something, I ain't moving funny, I'm just walking different uh-huh. Move to the A, now I'm talking different Movies to me, we don't block up. And I talk that since 10th grade I've been going pop, got a pop bag, fuck it on you want, man I've been looking forward more with most of the goals uh-huh. No one ever told them folks, it's more than gold no B5 come from the east side, where it get hot and greasy Talking like deep fried Please, we can do is make peace, not peace signs Doing this till I resign, huh? Don't mess with my buddies, don't touch my siblings Snakes nope. all around, I can hear that sibilance Talking too crazy, bro, good riddance Smoke in the face, me, I hold no bitterness yeah. Keep the big moves, low key Why you gotta move like that? Keep my cool No, I can't ever go back I'm all too easy. Yeah, I put my hits in a whip when it's hot. You call me breezy. Yeah, you say you can smoke and K easy. Little baby, I'm in. Let me know when you tryna take this out. Try to pencil it in. Cause I'm busy, baby. I'm far too busy. And your shorty still call me Kizzy. Watch my moves, cause you tryna discover me. Watch this, baby. I'm new. That always history. Buddy, I'm Valjean. Y'all live in misery. Y'all in this boat. I flow. Y'all the pen on me. Y'all in the deep end. Trying to make waves on me. Baby, it's scraps if you try and put the pen on me. Kizzy, it's not. Yeah, yeah. Keep it be moves, low key. Why you gotta move like that? Keep my cool. No, I can't never go back. Uh-uh, no way. New city, new place. New city, new place. Yeah.
1940, how we doing? Did you guys eat some lunch? Yes, we ate some lunch. Yes, it was good. But no, you're not gonna nap, right? Uh, because you have an amazing, amazing gift uh, this afternoon in our next speaker. Um, many of you have all had the opportunity to meet and to know Miss Ashley Vinay. She is the wife of Pastor Era, um, but she is a woman of God. She's a woman of honor. She's a woman of excellence in every way. Uh, she's currently going into her second year of KCBC. Woo! Uh, she has three children, um, Ariana, who is right over here. And this is Miss Ashley's mom. Can you guys wave? But also right in front, she's got Andrew. Yes. And Alexa, where's Alexa? Right there, right there, I see you, you're like right in front of me. Um, so she's a mom, she's a pastor, she has a pastoral anointing on her life. Um, she is one of my best friends and she is an anointed minister of the gospel. So would you all please welcome Miss Ashley Vinay. Welcome to today. I feel like I need to explain that for the non-locals. Um, it's a it's a strange thing. I feel like the Lord gave me that one day. I woke up and I just wondered if people were ever welcomed to today. And then I started saying it and getting kind of weird looks. Like, what does that mean? I've been here all day. And now it's caught on. So I know where I've been because people say welcome to today. So I would encourage you, welcome somebody to today. Get excited about what the day is going to bring. Um, if you don't for you, do it for somebody else. Welcome them with a smile. Um, I, like Pastor Catherine said, I am a mom of three. I am a KCBC student entering my second year. You are all invited to my graduation. It is on May 3rd, 2025 at Eagle Mountain International Church. Um, I will look out for you. Um, since I sent you guys this invitation now. Um, but the Lord really um, blessed me by giving me this opportunity. It's not an opportunity that I really even thought about, to be honest with you. Um, I've seen most of you throughout the week, but m most of my time I've been in the back. Um, I was doing crew meals and then helping with our guest speakers and um, in the back, and then I come out, but that was my primary that was my primary focus and my um, assignment for Southwest. And I absolutely enjoy that. I enjoy serving others. I enjoy um, taking care of the men and women of God to come through that room, attending to whatever needs they have, leading them into this. And so to get this opportunity is uh, a major blessing um, and I don't take it lightly. So I, Pastor Holden called me um, a few months ago and asked if I wanted the opportunity to speak. And I was speechless for a second because I was like, I'm just me. I'm just Ashley. Really? Y'all want me to come and speak? And then I said yes. And then I went into the antique store that I was about to go and shop at and found some cute frames. Um, and then I asked the Lord, what do you want me to speak on? And so I checked out what, what 1440 was being established and I was reading the scripture and I wasn't quite getting anything. So anytime I thought about it, I just prayed in tongues. Like y'all asked the question earlier, like how do you go deeper in him? How do you go in him? And it's, I prayed in tongues. I needed to know what he wanted this group of students to hear on this particular day after all the other speakers that we've had. And it wasn't until two weeks ago when I was flying to Nashville, I was on the plane and I just got everything. So I wrote it all down on my iPad of what I was supposed to do. But then this past Sunday, Pastor George was reading a portion of Pastor Terry's book and it dropped into my spirit something specific and very, very specific. Um, I'll tell you a story. When I was 12 years old, I gave my life to the Lord and was baptized. 
Do you think, oh, that's great. But how I did it was my sister got saved the day before and she got baptized and she got a party. Like my grandma was all excited and all the family came over. And my grandma told me, when, when you get saved, we're gonna have a party for you. So the next day I got saved because I wanted a party. That was my motivation behind it. So my mom was there, my grandfather baptized me, and I think there was somebody else from the church who was there because they had to give all that, the outfits or whatever. I got saved, went back, told my grandma, and I didn't get the party. And I, my first thought was, well, what was the point in that? Like, I thought I was gonna get a party out of it. But I wanna say it was probably about, this was fall of last year, I was taking one of my classes and I realized, what happened when I was 12 and made that decision. Um, and I went and I told my professor what happened and I was grateful for that particular class because I identified the goodness of God in my life at 12 years old last fall. He protected me. So some of you who were here last year might know that I um, am adopted. It's my birth mom, but I have, um, have adopted um, dad and he adopted me when I was 17 years old. He adopted both me and my sister when we were 17. And w when I was 12 is kind of when it all came out of how I found out and I have a different name and all that stuff. I, to my core and nobody could tell me otherwise, believe that the Lord kept me when I gave my life to the Lord the summer of me being 12 to then when I moved to Houston. Um, but right before turning 13, like a couple months before turning 13, spared me from a whole bunch of identity issues because we know the enemy comes and he comes in your mind and he comes in your thought life. And he comes to rob you of who you think you are, who you know you are to be, um, and who God says you are. So at that time, I didn't fully have an understanding of my identity in Christ. I didn't fully understand um, the depths of all of that. But what I did know was things were changing and I needed to adjust. But when I took this class in, in the fall and I realized the Lord took that confession when I was 12 years old and protected, he guarded my heart, he guarded my mind and protected me. It spared me through a lot of things in my teenage years. So Pastor George um, was reading a portion of Pastor Terry's book and I'll read the little portion of it, but specific instruction from the Lord is to lay hands on all the 12 year olds in this room and protect them the way the Lord protected me. So there's only a handful of you because I know the age is 13 to 18 in this room, but there are a few 12 year olds in this room. And I would ask that you exercise your faith and your boldness and come stand up here with me, please. Y'all can stand. I want y'all to stand right here. Yeah, face me. So Pastor George, this past Sunday, he read a portion of Pastor Terry's book. And this is when this dropped into me. Okay. Um, after I read this, I want everybody in this room, you're going to extend your hands and you're going to pray. And you're going to pray in tongues because these are your brothers and your sisters. They don't just stand up here in front of you all you're part of imparting to them as well. All right? Okay. Pastor George read this. Um, this is Pastor Terry, and she spent a lot of time with her grandmother. And I found it interesting that it was my grandmother's words that really inspired me to get saved. I think a portion of, there was a portion of uh, reverence for the Lord that I had, but I also was, um, I was the student who was kind of afraid. I was afraid to go to hell. So that was kind of my motivation behind it. But my grandmother wanted to celebrate salvation. She wanted to celebrate that union. And I wanted that not only for her, but I wanted that for me. So when I heard this, it just, it hit me. I'm not gonna read all of it. Um, but she talks about how she spent the night with her grandmother often and she slept right on top of her. She was real close to her. 
until she was six years old. So then it goes on to say, sometimes I thought her praying was going to keep me awake and it might have if not for the little radio she brought to bed beside us. Before we went to sleep, she'd search the AM dial for Sunday school music and preaching for me to listen to. When one station faded out or when or when off air, I'd poke her in the ribs. Seemingly without waking up, she'd reach out her hand and move the radio dial around until she found another station. However long it took, she kept finding new stations until I went to sleep. She didn't, she didn't just do this a few times. She did this every time I stayed the night, determined to keep me close. She even booted my grandfather out of the bed at one point, complaining that I kicked like a mule in my sleep. He said, Vanetta, it's either her or me. She picked me and he ended up sleeping in the other room. Eventually she decided I was old enough to keep, I was old enough to sleep by myself and my granddad got his side of the bed back. But until I was 12 years old, I slept as close as I could always. There is a certain point in your life, and Pastor Nancy talked about this last night, the age of accountability, which will probably be different for each of you based on maturity. But there's a point in your life where it's your faith. There became a point in Pastor Terry's life where it wasn't about her grandmother. She could no longer sleep right on top of her. She could no longer sleep right next to her. At some point she had to go to her room. She had to go to her bed and it became hers. What is she going to do now that it's hers? And so when I read that, uh, when I heard Pastor George say that, I was like, that was a turning point age for me. That's when a lot happened mentally, but then there was a lot just changing. There's a lot of change that happened in my life at that time, just like there's a lot of change happening now. Some of you are going to middle school, coming up here from super kid to 1440. And so I just wanted to pray. Um, can you hand me my Bible? Psalm 91, just verse one and two over you. I'm literally just gonna lay my hands on you. And I just want you to receive the protection of the Lord, protection over your mind protection over your heart, protection over your spirit, protection in every decision you have to make. Middle school's not easy. High school's not easy. Sometimes life's not easy, but the Lord makes it easier. His burden is easy and his yoke is light. So lean into him. So with every, um, I would like everybody to extend their hand towards them. I'd like you guys to just receive from the Lord. He who dwells in the secret place or the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, say he is my refuge and he is my fortress. Say you are my God and I trust you. So Father, I just thank you for each of these students that are right before me. I thank you that you saw them and you saw them on this day being protected for everything that they have to step through. I thank you for guarding their hearts, guarding their minds, protecting them, protecting their spirits. I thank you that for the influences that are around them that we silence the voice of the enemy and that they yield to your voice and your voice only. And I thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that dwells in each of them. In Jesus name, amen. Okay, y'all can go sit down. Okay, so after that, the Lord showed me another time in my life where I had to make major decisions and I was 18 and that's a big jump. You graduate high school and now you are an adult is what the world says. Your parents might say otherwise, <laughs> especially if you're still living at home. But that attitude of I'm an adult, I can do this on my own. I'm an adult, I can figure it out. Nope, we're not doing that either. So I want every 18 year old 
that's in the room to come up here. Quite a bit of y'all. This is a beautiful season that you have. You've had the opportunity, some of you, to be in 1440 Southwest Spring Retreat, EMIC, connected with each other, social media, youth group. You have the opportunity to hear the Lord with the protection of your parents the covering of your parents, the covering of your pastors, and you still have that. But now you're at a point in your life where you have to start making decisions. When you go to college, are you gonna eat dinner? Are you just gonna eat breakfast? Are you gonna do like I did and have cappuccinos and, and hot Cheetos every morning? Yeah, that's gross, y'all. I don't know why I did it, but. I did every morning. I'd stop at the gas station and do that. Why? Because I could. Not everything that you can do, you should do. So you're at a point in your life where you have to make the decision of who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to what the word of God says? Are you going to listen to that inward witness that's speaking to you? You've been through enough situations where you know when you're stepping into something and it just doesn't feel right. Are you gonna choose what's right? Only you can make that choice. So yes, legally, you are an adult. But one thing that adults, um, I think should do more often, and this goes for all of us, including myself, is some, this is something I'm actually practicing regularly, is every decision that I make, I've heard from him. Heart's desire of mine is to be Mary. I spend a lot of time in my life being Martha. Yeah. Busy, doing a whole bunch of stuff. There's things that I'm naturally good at, and I can do it in my own power. Where does God get the glory in that? Be Mary. Sit at the feet of Jesus, talk to him, ask him questions. Ask him, what kind of adult do you want me to be? Am I majoring in what I'm supposed to be majoring in? Am I working where I'm supposed to be working? Is the person that I'm dating or the person who likes me, is this who I'm supposed to even be entertaining any of my time with? James says to humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. To be humble isn't doing things your way. It's asking the Father, what is your way? And let me do that. Speak to me so I walk this life out the way you've designed it for me. Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. It could be as simple as a class that you need help with. I'm a KCBC student. This is the first time that I can honestly tell everybody in this room that I actually exercised faith for schooling. I've been to a lot of schools. I've done a whole lot of stuff as far as education is concerned, many different places. I failed a lot of classes in high school because I did it of what I thought. I did it out of my own mind. If you can learn now to be Mary, sit at that feet of Jesus, yield to his will in everything you do. One, it makes life a lot easier and it's fun. It's fun to be in the will of God. 
you walk around with peace. You have a confidence that other people don't have. There's something different about you. That's him. So I'm gonna lay my hands on each of you. For the boldness to walk out your adult life solely for the Lord, protecting your heart, protecting your mind from all unrighteous thinking. So Father, I just thank you right now. I thank you for your presence that lives and dwells in each of these students. I thank you that as they enter and just stepped into adulthood, that they yield to your will. They yield to your way. They hear your voice. They hear your voice and your voice only. I thank you for your presence that lives and dwells in each of them. Your presence that helps them know what decisions to make. Your presence that helps them know which, where to go. Father, I thank you for the peace, your peace that surpasses all understanding. They don't have to figure it out themselves. They don't have to figure out how to do something because you already have the answer. I thank you for seeing them. That this moment is very important to you. That they know you have their back. I thank you, Father, for the purposes that are in each one of them, that they walk out your plan for them individually with boldness. They don't steer to another path. They don't go a different direction. They stay on the path that you have designed for them. And Father, I just thank you for sending them community. Community of like-minded believers that they can establish their faith stronger in you as they enter this new season. Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses every student in this room from all unrighteous thinking. And Father, I just ask, everybody in the room stand up, please. For every person in this room who yields to you right now and raises their hands to you, I thank you, Father, for your cleansing, the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus, cleansing them from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Father, I thank you for every broken heart that is in the room, that they left it at the altar. I thank you for mending those hearts, sealing it with your love. And Father, I thank you that your presence and your words are bigger in them now than they've ever been and that that presence never goes away. I thank you that you quicken each person who is standing up in this room, raising their hands to you, Father. You quicken them with a deeper revelation of your love, a deeper revelation of knowing that the blood works in their life. And I thank you for that, Father. That there is freedom in you And we thank you in advance for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Awesome. 
Okay, I guess we'll start our message now. Y'all can go sit down. Praise God. Can you take that one back? Thank you. Thank you, love. Um, the Lord is good. He's so good. Thank you so much, Casey. It's funny, I always saw this in a certain room, um, but I had never actually seen it used until Southwest, so it's kind of fun to be able to use this. Whose ever this is. <laughs> um, so, welcome to today again. It's like it felt, the presence of God is so good. Y'all ask the question, like, how do you, how can you stay in this place? How can you live in this place? It's like, that's how you do. You acknowledge him. Um, Mr. Tony, who was up here the other day when he said all the music to shut all the music off and for you all to worship and for you to dance. But what did he have you guys do first? What was the first thing y'all did other than spread out? Maybe. Okay. The second one you prayed in tongues. That is the power that you guys have in you every single day. You don't just use it at home. I mean, you don't just use it at church. You can use that at home. Driving in your car. I was talking to, I think, Megan. I was giving her the scriptures or sending her some pictures or whatever. And I was trying to talk, but it was like, it was just tongues that was coming out. And it was just kind of funny to me because I recognized it um, in that moment. It was just kind of funny. But I wanted to... Um, talk to you all today about being established in him. The scripture talks about being established in him. And I, let's just go to Colossians. Her foundation scripture, Colossians chapter two, verses six through seven says, therefore, as you receive Christ, the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in faith, in the faith, just as you were taught abounding in thanksgiving. So on Monday, Dean Sykes was here and he had everybody raise their hand um, for those who wanted salvation. And I came out to look because I wanted to see I thought it was pretty remarkable that majority of this room was our, has already made that decision um, of salvation. And there was just a handful. So now you've made the decision. Can you put that picture of when I was 12 up? I have the button, the button down shirt. Um, there's a picture. Y'all look how cute I was. I looked at that picture and I was like, oh my gosh, no. But I look at this picture and that's 12 year old me. What is the purpose of me showing you this? I was a kid once, y'all. I wasn't always an adult. This was me living my best life with my little dress posed. I love picture day. I did then and I still do now. I buy all the pictures for my kids. They're up on the wall. I change them out. That's just what I do. I love picture day. But I like looking back at that picture because that person right there made the choice to live for Jesus. So one day you're going to look up and you're going to say, this is me when I made the choice. Some of you guys were younger. Some of you might have been older, but I was 12. That's 12 year old me. Um, then, you know, I didn't get the party, whatever. OK, we, we established that. It's fine. I, I party now with Jesus. It's great. No hard feelings. But then I was told you have to pray in tongues. And so the way it was kind of presented to me was, you know, you get baptized, you, you give your life to the Lord, give your life to Jesus, you get baptized in Jesus name, and then you pray in tongues and you go to heaven. And that was my understanding. So I was like, okay, I got two out of three of these things. I need that last thing. So is it possible to love Jesus and be saved and pray in tongues and still be insecure? Yes, it is possible. So I'll show you one of my pictures when I was 14. I was 14 and got saved. I was already saved and I was living for Jesus and that is me. I had my hair. I always wore my hair in braids. I think until I was, 
think in high school, I went to high school, um, but I always wore those headbands. They're these kind of like stretchy headbands. Do y'all have those still? No, you guys wear different kinds. Anyways, I always wore those headbands. The reason why is because I was very self-conscious about like when my hair, okay, so some of the black people in the room will understand, but like when your hair grows out and it's in braids and then it grows and it gets a little fuzzy on top, um, I tried to cover that with the headbands. And so I would get made fun of for wearing these big old headbands on my head. I didn't see it. I look now and I was like, why didn't I just put it in a ponytail or use some gel? Like, it just seems like, oh, that's logic. But that person right there, I was insecure. I told you guys earlier this morning, like I had to talk to the Lord about my pants is a whole thing with my pants and just around my waist. But I didn't want to wear a belt, but I always wore belts in that picture because of just how it was shaped and my hair and my shirts, all the things that people make fun of you that don't even matter. Do I remember any of those people who said anything about me? No, I don't remember any of their names. I don't remember what they look like, but what do I remember? When I look at that picture, I remember the words. I remember looking at that picture and I'm like, Yeesh, I remember like, yikes. Why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> That's not a true image of who I am in Christ. Okay, you can take it down now, it's fine. <laughs> That's not a true image of how God sees me. I shouldn't look back and see what everybody else said. I should only see what the Lord says about me. That I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That I'm the daughter of the most high God. Oh, do I have my crown? Yeah, so I wear this tiara sometimes. One day, Pastor Eric came home, and I was wearing this tiara. I was working on my New Testament survey, and I was just sitting at my computer, and I was just typing. And he came in, and he was like, this is what we're doing. And I was like, hello, Lady Ashley. I really officially am a lady, just so you guys know. Like, in, in Europe, I am. I'm Lady Ashley of Hogan or something like that. Um, but... I wear this sometimes to remind myself, I have it on one of my shelf, that I am a daughter of the Most High. Nobody can take that away from me. None of y'all can say anything to take that away from me. Even if you tried, you can't take that away from me. There might have been a point in my life that you could have, but now I know who I am. I'm established and rooted in Him. And when you know that, and you know that to your core, Nobody can take that away from you. The other part of that scripture says so to walk in him. And then it says to be rooted and built up in him. Pastor Holden talked about that. And we do that by knowing the word, applying the word, living the word. We talked about, um, Cameron mentioned being abiding in him. We talked about that a little bit earlier today um, with one of y'all's questions about abiding in him. And that just means hanging out with him. Like how many of y'all have friends and you're like, oh yeah, I wanna go hang out with my friends. Okay, so like half of you, so the rest of you don't hang out with anybody? I do. Ever, like nobody hangs out with anybody at any time ever. Um, we all have people that we like to hang out with. But how many of you look forward to like, I get to hang out with God today? I do. Like, I'm excited to learn something new. One of y'all's questions was, um, was about studying the Bible versus just like reading the Bible. And it's like, yeah, you can read words all day long. But one thing that I did one time was I wanted to know about a specific topic. And so then I look up all the scriptures on that topic. And then if you have a Bible, this Bible's not one, but then they have references that go down the center and then they'll take you to other places or you can use your technology, whatever you want to use. And it'll take you out of the scriptures. And the next thing you know, you look up and it's just been hours of time spent learning about that one topic. Oh yeah, I'll take this off. I still know who I am. I'm gonna leave it right here.
Another portion of that scripture says, you are built up in him and established in faith, just as you were taught. How many of you were taught something this week or learned something? I'm gonna look and see whose hands are raised. Cause if you didn't learn anything, we're gonna learn today. Okay, good, almost everyone in here, that's good. You all took time to position yourself to learn. That's another, that's another step and another way of getting and being established in him is some of y'all should have been out of town. Some of y'all could have been um, volleyball practice or football practice or whatever the camps that y'all have. There's band camp that's going on this week. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on getting ready for the school year. Some of y'all are going to college and really need to pack up your room because you haven't even started. But you're here today. You made the choice to be here this entire week. You made the choice to be here this afternoon, this morning. That's part of being taught is positioning yourself to hear. You're positioning yourself to hear the word you're positioning yourself to be in a room full of other believers. Don't you notice the difference when you walk into the room here with like-minded people versus when you walk into your classroom? Do you sense the difference? And then if some of you go to Christian schools, do you sense the difference? Yeah, is there a difference? Okay, just to make sure. <laughs> One thing I want to focus on, the last part of that scripture, it says abounding in thanksgiving. How many of y'all thank God for the things that you've learned today or yesterday or today is Friday, no, yesterday's Thursday or Wednesday or Tuesday or Monday how many of you had taken time to say, Lord, thank you. I needed that. The young man who was up here, was that Monday that he was up here or Tuesday? And he gave his testimony. And then he got the word from the Lord and he said, I needed that. He came here expecting to get something and received it. So you might not have been up on the stage to receive a specific word of knowledge, but that doesn't mean that you're walking out of here not being taught. I ask questions um, for those who are like in girls group or in middle school, sometimes high school, 1440. I ask a lot of questions because I can't walk this out for you. Only you can. So I wanna know, what does this look like? How are you applying this in your life? To be established in him means what to you? How are you actually living this out? So I wrote down a couple ways that you guys could live it out. Do you want that or do you wanna figure it out on your own? A couple ways, okay, I'm glad that you said that. Um, and your attitude. How many of you are so excited to start school? Me too. But then there's like 75% of the room is like, meh, meh. Not ready. But what if there's somebody at your school that needs what you just got this week? And you're the person to give that. I, on purpose, smile. I had to practice it because my mouth curves down. See? Okay. It naturally curves down. And I would go to school and people would think, oh, she's stuck up. She thinks she's better than us. 
And I was like, how are they getting that? Like I couldn't understand how they were actually getting that because nobody actually spoke to me. But my face made them not want to speak to me. So I practice in the mirror. This is something that I would do. I practice in the mirror just smiling because what I didn't want was something to be fake. There's nothing about me minus the dip nails that is fake. I didn't want that. I wanted authenticity just in my presence. So I would practice smiling. Practice it, practice it, practice it. But it wasn't until I was talking on the phone and I was having a conversation on my phone in front of a mirror that I saw what all of you would see because I was thinking and so my face was really serious. And so I was like, that's what they see. So could I have said, well, this is how God made my face. Oh, well, you have to deal with it. Could have. But I actually said, OK, Lord, can you help me represent you in my face? Because my presence matters to you. And if my face is unapproachable and it's not highlighting or drawing people to you, then can you help me change that? I'm not asking him to make me a different person or to be a different person. I'm asking him to help me acknowledge when to smile and have happy eyebrows. And so I practiced that. Now, am I telling everybody to go and practice smiling? Sure, kind of, I am, because it's exciting. When you walk into a place and somebody's smiling, doesn't it make you kind of want to stay a little longer? It does me. When we first started attending Eagle Mountain International Church and we drove onto the property and there are people who are standing there waving, I was like, these are my people. Hi. And I'm like, very excited, times three. And then the people who are smiling as you're walking to the front doors and then the people who are smiling at the doors and then the people who are smiling in the lobby and then the people who are smiling at the door into the sanctuary and then the people who are smiling helping you get to your seat. I'm like, I am in the right place with this group of people. There are more people like me. Another way is gra uh, gratitude of giving. Giving of your time or your resources, finances are, are, are an option. But how are you giving? It's like Alexa mentioned that the other day. What is your heart? Is your heart kind of just like, Ugh, I don't want to do that. I told you earlier about like wearing socks with sandals and like the skirt situation. And it's like my heart wasn't right in it. It's like I had to reposition my heart so that I didn't look at a group of people or a specific building and have an ill feeling or will towards them. So to be able to give something to the Lord, I had to then recognize what needed to leave that wasn't of him. Another way is how do you treat others? Some people, I, I specifically wrote gossip down because that's just something I have a no tolerance for. Um, I can see it. I can, it's like I almost have like, what do y'all call those spidey senses? Like Spider-Man, is that the right? Yeah, okay. I don't do superheroes, sorry y'all. Um, too destructive for me, but I can see it. I could see it being the new girl and I moved around a lot and you could see people talking about you. I could see it in a room, I could see the effects of it. How do you treat people? Do people just irritate you and you just don't wanna be around them? Is that reflecting the love of the Father? I just watched everybody up here this week receiving all the joy from the Lord. Leaving all the things at the altar with Dean Sykes here. Filling it up with, with laughter and um, love when Mark Hankins is here. But are you taking that out? Or are you just, oh, that was just a great week.
One area I really want to focus on is spending time with him. You guys ask a lot of, like, how do you know the will of God? How do you know what you're supposed to do? How do you know what you're not supposed to do? A lot of that is just, it's obedience. Are you obedient to your parents? And I mean, I really want to challenge you. How obedient are you to, to your parents? As simple as go clean your room. Is it actually clean? Or did everything just get stuffed in the closet or a drawer? Did you take the dog for a walk? Nobody can ask the dog because they don't speak English. But there are signs if a dog hasn't been out and been walked. I say those things because those things naturally apply to where you are in your life. But if you practice if you practice this now, it makes it so much easier for when the Lord tells you something in your 20s, when he tells you something in your 30s to do, because you won't have the attitude of, oh, I got this. Oh, yeah, Lord, I really did that. How do you trust somebody if you don't know them? I trust the Lord. I was um, 21 when I moved to California on my own. It was my first move that I did without my parents. And that's the first time that I can recall a blanket of boldness over me. I've never felt anything like that. I'm typically the person of, okay, you tell me what you need and then I'll do that and I'll execute anything. I'll execute your vision flawlessly. But when I had to step out, I needed the help of the Lord. When he asked me to do something, I needed his help because what he asked of me was to move from Washington, D.C. all the way to Los Angeles, California. That is a big step. But the boldness that I had in that moment to make that decision came from time spent with him. It came from praying in tongues. It came from asking, ask, seek, find. For anyone who asks, he'll provide the answer. For anyone who seeks, you will be found He has every answer for every step of your life. So ask him. One thing I've observed, um, more so this last year, I've really paid attention, is how much, and I mean this in the most respectful way, respectfully, however I want to say it, is y'all don't talk. There's not a lot of talking with this generation. Um, and so I was trying to figure out why, just kind of observing. And I noticed like with social media, like we didn't have social media when I was growing up. Um, it didn't happen. Like I'm OG when Facebook first came out, like you had to be a college student. So I was like one of the first thousands, I suppose, <laughs> of college students who had Facebook. Um, but even then it wasn't what it is now where you're constantly seeing all this stuff and taking in all this information and taking in all these images and taking in all these words, but then nothing is actually coming out of your mouth. So then the Bible says out of the abundance of your, ha abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So that means everything you've taken in at some point is going to come out. So what are you taking in? That goes back to answering your question earlier. How are you supposed to walk out everything that just happened this week? What are you putting in you? So in the school year, I told you guys earlier, I wake up um, and watch Nancy Dufresne at 630 in the morning. She's on the Victory Network. And it's the perfect time to 
do my hair and my makeup. My outfit's already picked out, all the other things are taken care of, but then I can sit down, I have my iPad, turn her on, and then I put my makeup and do my hair. And that's how I choose, that's what I choose to listen. And that's separate from saying, good morning, Lord. Thank you for waking me up. Thank you for my home. Thank you for my children. Thank you for the food that we have. Thank you for my coffee. Amen. I look forward to my morning coffee, the smell, the taste, the mug. <laughs> I look forward to it, but I thank the Lord for that. Constantly filling yourself up with his word, constantly filling yourself up with his thoughts and his ways so that every choice I make for the rest of that day has him at the start of it. Abounding in thanksgiving also means worshiping. Taking time to worship. I, I truly appreciate what Mr. Tony did here the other day because somebody after spring retreat asked me, how do I do, like at spring retreat we have the music and then all the kids are here and we're all together and we're all excited and we're all jumping around and we're all praising and worshiping together but then I go home and nobody's there. And it's like, yes, but you are, you're there. Nobody can walk this out for you. You have to do it. God's going to speak to you. He's going to speak to you. So when Mr. Tony said, we're going to worship without music, if y'all are the ones who don't have a phone or, I mean, I don't even think people have radios anymore. Does anybody in the room have a radio? What? I know you do. <laughs> Does it have a tape player in it? Raise your hand if yours has a tape player in it. Wow. So y'all know what a cassette is? Wow. That is, that makes me so happy on the inside. So maybe some of y'all do listen to the radio. But finding ways to worship without music. Simply just thanking God. You can worship him in your actions. You can worship him in your words. You can worship him in your outfits. You can worship him um, just simply by, thank you, Lord, for coffee. I thank the Lord for coffee just because it's a time that I have with him. When I drink my first cup of coffee in the morning, I, it's like I have these times of just connection with the Lord. Not only am I genuinely grateful for the mug that I have, but I'm grateful for the home that I have the ability to wake up, the ability to have a home, to have a coffee maker, to have a hallway. Like we've been downtown this week. I'm sure some of y'all have seen people who don't have a home on the street this week. So something so simple of thanking the Lord for your home I get it. Some of y'all share a bedroom with your sibling and you might not want to do that. But you know what? You have a bed. Can you make different choices for your kids later? Potentially, maybe that's on you. And that's on you yielding. Worship isn't just music. Worship is a heart posture. Is your heart in everything you do to glorify God. That portion of the scripture, it says, so walk in him. And I think it's so easy just to skip over that. Like you just read it, it's a comma, so walk in him, comma, and you're on to verse seven being rooted. But to walk in, what does it mean to be in something? To 
To walk in or be in means you're enclosed. You are enclosed around. You're within. So there's me. And then, okay, y'all come up here. You guys, all, all six of you, these first six here, come up here. And just make a circle around me. You guys got to hold hands. I am enclosed within this circle. Everything that this circle is, I am. So what am I enclosed in? What music am I listening to? What friends am I listening to? Am I obedient to what my parents have to say? Do I have a bad attitude about what my parents have to say? Am I listening to what my teachers are saying? Do I treat my siblings with kindness? Am I patient? Am I loving? Do I look at me and see the Lord? What am I enclosed around? Thank you. So for those of you who are taking notes, I really want you to ask yourself that question. What am I surrounded by? What am I in? Have I surrounded myself with the things of the Lord? You could have all the gifts. You can have all the talents. You could be the most amazing. Uh, I don't know. What's a, what's a good, I ran track, so I'll just say track. I ran track because I could stay in the lines. And so I surround myself with my teammates. But then during track season, everything I did, everything I ate, everything that I didn't eat, the specific shoes that I wore, the socks that I wore, everything I did mattered for that one thing. So to be established in him, everything you do, everything you surround yourself with, everything you hear, is it speaking heaven's language? Time goes by so fast. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you will discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable, what is good and good, acceptable and perfect. Being conformed to this world doesn't mean avoiding or pretending like you don't see it. Like we all go to school and there are those people who are not using good language. I know that's nobody in this room. We all go to school and there's always going to be those people who are going to try and bypass the system in dress code in attitude, in being punctual, getting to class on time. So it doesn't mean that you just don't see any of that. You know it's there, but are you participating in that? So being conformed to something doesn't mean that you don't see it or that it's not there, it means you're not participating in that. We are called to look different. We are called to sound different. I even put on here, we're called to smell different. And the reason that I put that on there is because Pastor Terry, mentioned on Sunday that she walked into her um, office and like her foyer area and there was an aroma that was in the area and 
it, it moved her because she felt like the Lord did that for her. And that blessed me because it's like time spent with the Lord, it heightens all of your senses, even to the point of a smelling of an aroma can bring you such joy and connection to the Lord. So yeah, that's why I put that. You can put that one down and you can reference that on for yourself. But our senses were heightened and I saw it when y'all worshiped without the music. I saw those who got filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time. I saw those who went a little bit deeper in their time of praying. You prayed harder than I've ever seen or those who started dancing a little different than what they normally would have. our time like we got two minutes y'all <laughs> when I was praying over the 18 year olds um, I mentioned about being Mary I think this is how I'll close Mary recognized Jesus right in front of her. She recognized the importance of listening to his voice, what he had to say. She sat at his feet. So when I, I look at that, I think, okay, Martha was in the back, she was doing a whole bunch of stuff. But Mary stopped for a second and recognized this is a specific time that I need to spend time with the Lord. She could have done so many other things. She could have been in the kitchen helping her sister. She could have been setting a table for all the people who are in the house. Was what Martha was doing, was it wrong? No. She just wasn't sensitive to something that changed. So if I could leave you with anything for this next school year, be sensitive. You all have the Holy Spirit inside of you. Be sensitive to his yielding. Be sensitive, I mean, be sensitive to his, his leading. Yield to him. When you get that feeling in your stomach, something doesn't feel right, stop. Don't feel rushed to make a decision. I talked to someone the other day who was like, well, I, I had to do this. And it's like, no, you didn't. You didn't have to. You could have stopped and waited for an answer. So just stop. Stop and wait on the Lord. We're entering a new school year. It's an election year. I know that makes school real fun. You don't have to fall into the pressure of the chaos that happens. It's a choice. So in everything you do, ask the Lord. Everything, friends, practice with your outfits, practice with what backpack to get, what phone case, those little things that you think aren't that big of a deal, they matter to God. Did y'all get something out of this? Yeah. The time went by so fast. Thank y'all for this opportunity. Love you very much. All right. Good job, love. That's my wife. Good job. Cool, cool. All right. Um, next up, uh, we're going to actually stand up. Stand up, just. Preacher said, shake something, stretch something. Reach up to the sky. Ooh. You don't have to make the old person noises, but I am. Ooh. No. 
Hope there wasn't too much cracking and popping. All right. So I want you all to stay standing. Stay, we'll stay standing as we welcome our next speaker. Um, one of my one of my buddies. She is the I will say how am I gonna say this? She's kind of one of our sp I can't call her spark plug because that's Kyle's nickname. Um she's kind of a fire starter. Um she always knows the exact moment when we need to go from you know, as we get into these places of worship, and then she'll run up and be like it's time for joy now. And then the place just erupts. Um, and that's what I appreciate, appreciate about her sensitivity. She's also one of the project managers for um, Southwest here. So all the things you see, she is one of the three people who made this event happen. Um, she's also a minister on staff. And for those of you who are familiar with Super Kid, um, outside of this room, we will call her Lieutenant Commander Aubrey. But today, it's just Miss Aubrey and Miss Aubrey Allman. Come on up. How's it going, 1440? Praise the Lord. First of all, I just want to say thank you to you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you for being hungry for the word, hungry for the Lord. All of you know that you have wristbands on your wrist and you can scan yourself out when you decide to do that. But you're here, you're in your seats, you're ready for the word. So thank you for being here. And I also want to thank our pastors Pastor Era, Miss Ashley, Pastor Catherine, Pastor Holden, Pastor John, Miss Brittany, Pastor George and Terry, Brother Copeland, Sister Copeland. It is a complete honor to be able to stand here and minister the word in this place. It's always an honor to minister the word in any capacity, right? Even when it's in your hallway at school, it's an honor to be able to speak the name of Jesus and share this book with somebody else. But it's a, it's a different, it's, there, there's different levels of things that the Lord allows you to do. And to me, because I sat in your chairs when I first came to the Southwest Believers Convention in 2016 as a 17-year-old, I sat where you sat in this very ballroom. I've had encounters with the Lord marking life-changing moments right here where the Lord completely flipped my life around. So to now be able to stand before you and impart and share, hopefully in a way that, that somebody else did to me all of those years ago, that is an honor. So I am so grateful for this opportunity. And I'm so thankful for the foundation that Miss Ashley just laid because I was sitting there listening and so many things that she was talking to you all about were things that the Lord had put on my heart as well. So if you're ready, have a seat. And we're just going to keep going, honestly. We're in Colossians 2, right? All week. Praise the Lord. So if you're there, stay there. If you're not there, turn there. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. And we are going to start, uh, start talking about establishing your habits. As you're turning, I also want to say thank you and acknowledge my parents are in the room, my mom, my dad, my sister is in the room. And also I wanna share, a lot of you may know by now or may not have known, I just got married July 6th. Praise the Lord, God is so good. That's a whole other testimony. Um, God is good. And my husband is at work right now. So his name is Jordan. He's very tall and he's amazing. And he is 100% the man that the Lord had for me. And I am so blessed. And I'm wearing my wedding converse today because I knew that he couldn't be here. So it's like, I mean, I've got the ring, yes. But the converse were just another touch. I was like, oh, my husband is supporting me because he is. So 
Are you there in Colossians 2? Yes. Okay, Colossians 2. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. What I love that Miss Ashley pulled out of these verses, she pulled out your part, the, the practical side of it. And one thing that I was super excited about to get to be towards the end of the week, it's Friday. Today's our last like full day in the sense that we had, you know, the morning, afternoon and the evening. Tomorrow's another full day. We have healing school in the morning. We have the evening session. So getting towards the end of the week, you start getting those questions asked and you start thinking, well, what about when I go back home? And you start kind of, kind of getting pulled out of the bubble right? Like you came into this word bubble. The arena actually is like an arena. It looks like a bubble, right? It's round. So you're in this word bubble and it's easy to just forget about life and forget about home and your state and everything else. But when you get to Friday, it starts coming back up and you start realizing I'm about to step back into whatever that was, right? So our theme is established and we're talking about how you need to be established in what? What are some of the things we've talked about this week? What do you need to be established in? Faith, Faith the word, God, love, peace. peace. You need to be joy. You need to be established. You need to be rooted. But now that it's Friday, and you're about to go home, I want to talk about what you need to establish. So now that you are established, what do you need to establish? I'll clarify. It's really easy to get established in the Word of God. God makes it easy to get established in the Word of God. It's so easy that a five-year-old can receive Jesus. It's so easy that a three-year-old could receive Jesus. I've seen it. I work with super kids. I work with preschoolers. I see their hearts. It's easy for them to receive Jesus. Miss Taylor talked about earlier this week, the draw of the Holy Spirit. He draws us. He helps us. He makes it easy. What's not as easy is establishing the word in your life. You can become established in the word like that. And you can say, right now in this moment, I make a quality decision, this is true. This word is true. It's that easy to become established in the word of God. It takes more time to establish the word in your life. We're gonna break it down some more, but I want you to just hang on, follow along, we'll get there. Can I get my first picture on the screen, please? It's a tree. It's a tree. Does anybody know what kind of a tree this is? Somebody said a fig tree. No. Willow, no. Avocado, no. Almond? I wish I would have done an almond tree. That would have been so punny. <laughs> Missed opportunity. It's not a lemon tree. It's not an olive tree. <laughs> it's not an apple tree. I heard somebody say it. It's an orange tree. It's an orange tree. Can I get the next picture up there, please? Should I have started with that one? It is so pretty. It is so pretty. This tree is beautiful. I have never even seen an orange tree like that in my life. I don't even know if I've seen an orange tree, period. But it's a lot easier to know what kind of a tree that is when there's what on it? Fruit. Oranges. Yes. That first picture, y'all were guessing all sorts of things. Things that I didn't even think about. Right? The first fruit that came to my mind this morning was oranges. <laughs> when the Lord gave me this idea. You knew that it was an orange tree because of the fruit. 
because there are physical oranges on this tree. Are both trees established? Yeah. They're both planted in dirt. They're both rooted in soil. They're both grounded. They are both two very established trees. One of them has no fruit. The other has a lot of fruit. What's the difference? Do you think there is a difference? They're both orange trees. But one tree is an orange tree and nobody knows that it's an orange tree. But everybody knows that the second tree is an orange tree. You are known by your fruit. You are all in this room right now together. So I'm just gonna say that you are all established in the word. All of you just sat and listened to what Miss Ashley said. So you are all established in what she just ministered to you. But when you leave this room, every one of you has a choice. If you are going to establish that in your life, what fruit are you going to establish after you have become established? You following me? Another example, exercise plans. How many of you have heard of an exercise plan? Or you've done an exercise plan? Or you've done workout routines for your sports? Whatever that is. They exist, right? They are an established thing. I can believe all day. Yeah, workouts, workouts are great. Exercise is great. I am established in the fact that they exist. I'm established in the fact that they work. I see people running and I can't run that fast for lots of reasons. But one of the reasons is I don't run. I don't practice. I tried to be a runner in 2020. I was at home. I was like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go run two miles. I did, I got up to two miles. Now, if you saw me, there's no way you would say I was running. You'd be like, she's barely jogging. I tried it. It works. There are changes that happen. There are benefits to it, right? I'm not a runner even though I am fully established in the fact that if I were to wake up every morning at 5 a.m. and go outside and run miles and run laps, I would get stronger, I would get faster, I would get better, I would see changes in my body, changes in my mental health, all of that, right? But I haven't established that in my life. Any exercise plan. I can believe all day that exercise plans work. I used to do one called Pure Bar, B-A-R-R-E, and I would literally go to this workout class and I established that as a routine every Friday. I established in my life, I'm going to go to this class and I'm gonna work out and it's gonna be great. And I was established in that for two years. And I went every Friday that I could. You know, we had like Super Kid Camp in there and you know, different events, Southwest, Spring Retreat, all of those things. But I was established in that. And I established it in my life. I just got married. Lots of things have changed. I've moved, so I'm no longer the same distance from that studio as I was before. We went on a honeymoon. We've got Southwest now. There were all these things changing, all of these plans. So I, honestly, I unestablished that from my life. I was like, this was, a, this was something that I had established for this time, for this season. Now. It's not the right season for that. So I'm gonna stop. And I stopped doing it. So right now I am in a place in my life, I'm in a transition where I get to establish new things in my life. And it's not only establishing things in my life, but I get to establish things in my marriage with my husband. So for those of you that are getting ready to go through a transition, Miss Ashley just prayed over you too. Know that I identify with you because I'm in a really big transition right now. And it's great, it's amazing, it's the Lord. But this is a, a critical moment in my life where I get to decide what I want to establish in my life. And it is going to affect my marriage, 
It is going to affect the ministry the Lord has given me. It is going to affect the kids that we have one day, years down the road. It affects all of that. The things that I establish today in my life. So my goal is I'm going to establish a new workout routine, right? Like these are things that I want to do, but I can be established in it all day long. That workout is that workouts are good. The exercise is good. But if I don't actually do it, if I don't actually establish that in my own life, what's it going to do? Nothing. I'm going to be like that first tree up there with no fruit on it. Established in the dirt, believing that exercise is good, but I'm showing no fruit. Another example, when Jordan proposed to me, we were established in the fact that we were getting married. We were rooted in that. We knew it was what the Lord said. The Lord spoke to both of us. We were established in the fact that we were going to get married. But we did not get married until July the 6th. So from the time we got engaged until July the 6th, our marriage was not established. And that greatly changed the way that we operated because of something that had not yet been established in our lives. Does that make sense? We knew we were getting married. We were established in that fact, but our actual marriage was not established until July the 6th. Up until July the 6th at 2.30 p.m., I was still Aubrey Marbutt. I knew I was going to become Aubrey Almond. That was established. I knew that I knew, but it did not become established in my life until I actually stood with Jordan, Pastor George, our family around us before the Lord, and I said my vows and he proclaimed us as husband and wife, and then it became established. There was something I had to do to see that come to pass. So you can be established in the word all day long. You can meet people on the street and they'll tell you, yeah, I believe God's real. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I received Jesus when I was five but they look like that first tree up there because you see them and you're like, you don't look like a Christian. <laughs> Can we be real? Your fruit matters. Your fruit matters. I wanna go to Matthew chapter seven. We're gonna go to Verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Wow. You will recognize them by their, by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree a healthy, healthy tree bears good fruit but the diseased tree the diseased tree bears bad fruit a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire thus you will recognize them by their fruits People will know that you love Jesus by your fruit. People will know that you love Jesus by the way that you act. Or people will question if you love Jesus by the way that you act. They're going to see you and they're either going to know something is different about you or they're going to know that you're a liar. We're going to be known by our fruit. Can you be a Christian and sin? Yeah, we have choices every day. We have things that we say that we need to repent for. We have things that we say that we need to apologize for, things that we do. 
when I get hungry, sometimes I say things I should not say. And sometimes I can be a little mean. And that is not an excuse. It is not to say, I was just really hungry. Being hungry is not a reason to sin, okay? Being hungry is not a reason to be mean. What it means is that I know myself enough to know that one, I just really shouldn't let myself get hungry. But two, if I know that I'm hungry, I am going to watch my words. I am going to watch my face. I might even step away from some people if I know that I have missed my lunch and I just need to take a minute, I need to start praying in tongues because it's real. Is that real for any of y'all? Or maybe it's just been a day. Maybe you were stuck in traffic. Maybe you got a bad grade on a test. Whatever that thing is, we all have a response to that, right? You are in control of how you act. I say this to the super kids all the time. I'm like, we can make good choices or we can make bad choices. And that is true no matter what age you are. You can be a Christian and still make bad choices. God is not, who was it? Was it Pastor Nancy last night? She said that the Lord, the Lord is not the one controlling you. The devil is the one who will, who will control people. The Lord does not control you. So we have these, is it possible to get both trees up there together on the screen? I didn't ask them that before, so if not, it's okay, because you guys have seen the trees, so you know what I'm talking about, right? Both of these trees are rooted in dirt, grounded in soil. They're trees. They're both orange trees. They have the same identity. Their identity is the same, but they look completely different. If all of you know Jesus, if all of you have received Jesus, every single one of you has the same identity as a child of God. You are his son, you are his daughter. You are a child of God. You are a Christian. I don't know all of you outside of this room, so I don't know what kind of choices that you make, but I know that you have the choice. You can choose to live a life where everyone sees your fruit and knows that person loves the Lord. Or you can choose to live a life where everyone sees your fruit and they say, that person does not know the Lord. The pictures of these trees, one has fruit, one doesn't have fruit. But the truth is, every one of our lives produces fruit. But the word says that it's just good fruit or bad fruit. You're either a healthy tree or you're a diseased tree. Going back to the, the actual trees, I was looking up, um, it was hard to find a picture of an orange tree with no oranges on it. <laughs> I was having to get really specific when I was searching it. And I found this like gardening website. Thank you so much. I found this gardening website and it said, here are some reasons why orange trees don't produce fruit. The tree is not old enough to produce fruit. It's a valid reason. The tree doesn't receive enough sunlight. The flowers aren't being pollinated. Cold temperatures are killing the flower buds or there is improper watering, fertilizing, or pruning. So if you see a tree and you know it's an orange tree and there's no oranges on that tree, there's something wrong. There's a reason why there are no oranges on that tree. It's the same way in our lives. If we know that we're a Christian, we know that we love Jesus, but there's no fruit that has been established in our lives, there is something wrong. We know it's not the first one. The first one said the tree is not old enough to produce fruit. All of you are old enough to produce fruit because all of you made the choice to scan into this room and sit down in the seat and listen to what we're saying. So that's already fruit. I see that fruit. That's why I thanked you for being hungry for the Lord and hungry for the word because I can see it because you're here. 
and you're looking at me now and you're listening to me now, so I see it. So you know that that first one does not really apply to you because you are old enough to produce fruit. You're old enough to know right from wrong. You're old enough to make choices, right? So the other ones, the tree doesn't receive enough sunlight, the flowers aren't being pollinated, cold temperatures kill the flower buds, improper watering, fertilizing, or pruning. When you think about that in the context of your walk with the Lord, it all has to do with the word and it all has to do with your habits. Establishing, going back to the plants, establishing a tree in the dirt is a one-time thing when it's a tree outside like that. Those orange trees aren't gonna be uprooted and moved somewhere else. That's a one-time thing. But in order for them to be healthy orange trees, they have to have sunlight. They have to have water. They have to have fertilizer. They have to have good temperatures. All of those factors matter. It's the same way with us. The things that you establish in your life matter. The habits that you form matter. The times that you read the word matter. I typically don't talk about things being habitual in our relationship with the Lord because when I grew up, I was very much checklist Christianity minded. And it would make me almost scared or nervous if I like didn't check the box, right? I was like, oh, I didn't read the Bible today. Oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? Like, it was just a pressure to me of I want to please God. I want to live for Him. I want to love Him the best way that I know how. And so it became very religious for me. So as a minister now, I typically don't talk about habits in this way, but Jesus had habits established in his life. So I wanna look at, at those verses and talk about Jesus. Luke chapter four, we'll start in verse 16. I'm flipping over there. Okay, Luke chapter four. Verse 16, it says, And he came to Nazareth, this is Jesus, where he had been brought up, where he was raised. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. We're going to stop there for a second. I've got a couple of other translations. Can I get that in the NLT, please? That was the ESV. It says, when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read the scriptures. Jesus had a routine. He had a habit. I think we have this picture of Jesus sometimes, like he was just this real loosey goosey person, just kind of floated around and did whatever he wanted to do and walked wherever he wanted to walk. And he went over here and he healed a person and he did this and he did that and he talked here and he got on a boat and he walked on the water and he was just like, I'm Jesus. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Do you think about Jesus that way sometimes? No, you, no? that's a good thing. <laughs> I do. I read the New Testament and I'm just like, wow, he was just like going and doing and going and doing. And, but he had habits. Even though every single day of his life didn't look the same because he ministered to different people every day of his life, he went to different towns, he went to different villages, he talked to different crowds. Sometimes he traveled by boat, sometimes he traveled by feet, sometimes he walked on the water. He still had habits established in his life. We know this because it's what the word says, that it was his custom. A custom is, um, I don't want to say the word ritual as in the sense of like, it's a ritual, like spooky, weird spirituality type thing. But it was something that he practiced. A custom is like a tradition. It's something that you do regularly. You become accustomed to doing something. You get used to it. It says, as usual, he went to the synagogue. It was a habit 
for Jesus to go to the synagogue and to read the scriptures. That was a habit. That was a routine. And what's cool, when, let, let's, let's keep reading. Verse 17, it says, The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So because Jesus did something out of habit, he found himself in the word. That was his identity. That was about Jesus. It was a prophet. It was a prophecy from Isaiah talking about the man and person of Jesus. And he stood there in the synagogue and he read it out of habit. And one day it was revelation to him of, I have found myself in the word. So many of you, like Miss Ashley was saying, want to know, like, how do I hear God? How do I, how do I know what I'm called to do? How do I know who I am? How do I keep this fire going when I go home? You find yourself in the word, but you may not find yourself in the word the first time you pick it up and read it. You might have to form the habit before that revelation starts clicking because it's new, because it's foreign and because the devil's real. The devil can't take away from the word of God at all. The word of God is established. And whether or not you read it, whether or not you believe it does not change the fact that the word of God is established. But when you start establishing the word in your life, the devil is going to try to take it. It says that, that, it, that the, the thief comes to steal the word. The devil is trying to steal the word. So every time you go home and you open up the word, your phone dings. Oh, got to check. Got to check. Back to the word. I'm back, Jesus. I'm focused. I'm focused. It dings again. Uh, okay. I'm going to put this over here now. Back to the word. Your watch buzzes. Uh, okay. I'm going to take the watch off. And then you're back to the word. And then you hear a loud noise outside or like all of the distractions, all of the things. You have to establish the habit. I am turning down my life and I am turning up the word. It's not a bad thing to have a set time every morning to read this. It doesn't make you religious. Commitment is required to bear fruit. You have to establish this in your life if you ever want to see any fruit in your life. Even though you came to Southwest Believers Convention, even though you sat here and you said, I'm established in the word, I'm rooted in the word, I'm grounded in the word. But if you go home and you never open it, this won't be established in your life. It is up to you and your habits. Terry Savelle Foy always quotes, I believe it's John Maxwell who says the, the secret of your future is hidden in your, or the secret of your success is hidden in your daily routine. And you can go all sorts of directions with that statement and talk about leadership and success and skills and all of that, but apply that to your life as a believer. The secret to your fruit is hidden in your daily fellowship with the Lord. Amen. Your daily fellowship with the Lord. Because you know what's cool about fruit and trees is that if that tree is filled with oranges and somebody comes and picks them off, what does it have to do? Produce more oranges. Or if nobody picks off the oranges, what happens when they get ripe? They're going to start falling off and hitting the ground. And what does the tree have to do? Produce more oranges. So just because you come and you have a one-time encounter with the Lord in this ballroom in Fort Worth, Texas, and you see fruit in your life for a week, doesn't mean that you're set for life 
to keep seeing fruit. Your salvation is secure. Amen? Amen. You could have received Jesus and have meant it and have been so true about it in your heart and in your life in this moment and your salvation can be secure and you could leave this ballroom and you could go talk nasty to your friends and you're still a Christian. The Lord still loves you. The pastor said that earlier on pastor panel, the forgiveness of God is, is always available to you. But what kind of fruit do you wanna show? Because Matthew says, that what happens to the trees that are unhealthy and diseased and they bear bad fruit? It says they're cut down. I'm not telling you that God's gonna cut you down if you make a wrong choice. He's not. He's not waiting for you to mess up so that something bad can come into your life. But do you know who is waiting for you to mess up to bring bad into your life? The devil. People have this this was something that, that clicked so strong in me. I believe it was earlier in this year. If not, it was the end of last year. People get, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a plot of the enemy to make people believe that God is just up in the sky, watching, breathing down your neck and waiting on you to mess up. Because the moment you mess up, you no longer have Psalm 91 protection. And so anything could happen. It's twisted because the devil is the one waiting on that to happen. The devil is the one waiting on our words to slip so that he can bring the curse into our lives. It's all him. Everything bad is from Satan. Everything good is from God. But again, the difference is God doesn't control us, but the devil will take every opportunity that you give him to get control of your life. Every open door, the enemy will take. Every open door, even if it's just cracked. So we don't read the word out of religion. We don't form habits out of fear. We don't walk with God just because we don't want something bad to happen. We have a relationship with him because he loves us and because we love him. But that should fuel why you form habits and why you choose to establish the word in your life. Because you know that when you're walking with God, he's not gonna let anything bad happen to you. He's going to guard you. He's going to protect you. And you know that when something bad does happen, it was not from God. It was not from God. It was not from God. Pastor Nancy talked to you guys last night about the devil accusing God. So say something bad does happen. Does it mean that you sinned? Does it mean that you did something wrong? No. We live in a fallen world. The devil is running rampant, trying to, to, to steal and kill and destroy wherever he can. So we don't let the bad things that the enemy does affect our fellowship with the Lord and affect what we have established. Does that make sense? Okay, I wanna make sure I'm being clear with you on that. Because everything that the word says is true. Psalm 91 is true. Psalm 91 is true. It is established. But how are you establishing Psalm 91 in your own life? Amen. Psalm 91 says, I will say of the Lord. If you aren't saying it, you're not establishing that in your own life. It's your choice. And again, that's not out of a fear place because God's got you and he wants the best for you. The flip side of that is the enemy wants the worst for you. So we stay rooted and grounded and established in the Lord and we establish the Lord in our lives. We get rooted and grounded and established in the word and we establish the word in our lives because we wanna stay as close to him as possible 
because we want to walk with him, because we want to be with him, because we want to know him more. Luke 22, verse 39. This is Jesus. I'm going to go in my Bible too, just so I have it open. This is Jesus. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. Do you guys know what's about to happen right here? You can say it. Anybody know? He's about to get arrested. And then what happens? He gets crucified. So this is Jesus in the garden. It says, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and he knelt down and he prayed. I'm going to stop there. Because this was leading up to Jesus' darkest hour. Hearing Pastor Terry talk about what Jesus physically went through in this moment will change things for you. He knew they had just had communion. They had had the Last Supper. He knew Judas had betrayed him. He knew it was coming, okay? And where did he turn? He turned to his habits. It says that it was as his custom, he went to the Mount of Olives. The Passion Translation says, Jesus left the upper room with his disciples and as was his habit, he went to the Mount of Olives his place of secret prayer. In Jesus's hour of greatest distress and agony, he leaned on his habits, which was the Lord, right? He leaned on the Lord. He entered into a time of prayer, but had he not already established that as a habit in his life, we don't know what he would have done. It's the beauty of, of Jesus being a man, right? We have in the word how he lived it out and how he never sinned and how he did it right. But he still had the choice. He still had to create customs and habits in his life because he was a man. Was he fellowshipping with the Lord at all times? Absolutely. He was talking to God all the time, right? But even Jesus had to have times of secret prayer. Even Jesus had to get away from everybody else and just go be with the Father. Even Jesus, if Jesus had to establish that as a habit in his life, how much more do we need to do it? Your habits are the things that you will go back to when the enemy is putting pressure. Because yes, the Lord has got you. Yes, the Lord does not want any bad thing to, to come into your life. And no, he's not just allowing things to take place. But do bad things happen? Yes. It's not God's fault because he's good. And in those moments where the enemy is trying to stir up trouble and pressure, what are you turning to? It's really easy in this moment to say, I'm turning to God. But if you don't establish that as a habit in your life, you're gonna turn to Netflix. And you're gonna say, I just need to tune everything out and just get my mind off of what's happening and I just need to watch a show. If that's your habit, that's what you're going to turn to. If your habit is gossip, the moment something happens in your life, in your friend group, where are you going to turn? You're going to turn to gossip because that has become established in your life 
as a habit. But if you choose to establish that you are a person who guards your words and you take things to the Lord, then when something happens, you're not going to turn to gossip because that's foreign to you. That's not normal to you. So you're going to turn to guarding your words and talking to the Lord. It's so easy at these conventions to say what we want to happen, to say what we want to establish. But if you don't actually establish it, there's no fruit. You choose what fruit is going to be established in your life. You have to establish your habits or your habits will establish you. Let's talk about gossip. If gossip is a habit to you, when the Word of God talks about gossip, it actually identifies that person as a gossip. It doesn't say a person who gossips does this. It says a gossip. So when you choose to create that habit, you become that thing. So that's what I mean by if you don't establish your habits, your habits will establish you. Same thing with alcohol. If you establish a habit of turning to alcohol, that habit of alcohol will establish you as an alcoholic. Because that'll become the thing that you turn to when the pressure's on. And I think we are all aware that there is pressure every day. The enemy's not letting up. The pressure's not getting lighter. The Lord is the one who takes that pressure and shields us and protects us. And he says, here, give me that burden. Here, give me that care. Here, give me that pressure. I'll take it. But if we don't turn to him, it's going to keep building. It's going to keep building. You have to establish your habits or your habits will establish you. If your habit is prayer, you're going to be known as a man or a woman of prayer. That habit of prayer will establish you. And that's a good thing. That's an amazing thing. It goes both ways. It's not just the negative, but it's also the positive. If you establish the habit of reading the word, that habit of the word, the word will establish you. I think about Rick Renner and how many habits he had to establish to memorize books of the Bible. What, like the whole New Testament? I mean, this man is known for that. Like you hear Rick Renner and you think, oh, he doesn't need notes. He doesn't need a dictionary. He knows the Hebrew. He knows the Greek. He's the scholar, all of those things. But he didn't just say one day in a Southwest Believers Convention, I'm going to learn the New Testament and then just go back to his home and carry on with his life and watch TV and kick his feet back. No. He had to establish the habit of learning it, of memorizing it, of absorbing it. Miss Iva. Everybody thinks about Miss Iva and everybody gets excited when you see your name on the speaker schedule because Miss Iva's coming and you know the fire of God is coming with her. And you know we're going to have to move chairs. And you know that we're just getting ready for all of it, right? Yeah. She didn't wake up one day and operate in that level. If you talk to Miss Iva, she'll tell you her habits of waking up in the middle of the night, waking up early in the morning. I heard the story of her one time when she was being trained to pray and, and she, I don't even remember, I don't know if this is when she was in Alabama or where she was, but she was underneath this woman who was training her and this woman was drilling her praying in tongues. She was like, okay, come on, we're going for two hours, let's go. And like Miss Iva would get tired and soft, start slowing down. The lady's like, no, come on, you're doing it. Let's go, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. It took practice. She had to establish a prayer life to be established as a prayer warrior. 
I'm sure she was established in the fact that prayer works. How many of you are established in the fact that prayer works? Okay, but how many of you would say that maybe you don't feel like all of your prayers have worked? You have to learn to pray. And to learn to pray, you have to learn the word because you have to pray the word for your prayer to be effective. So if you establish a habit now of praying every morning in tongues, five minutes, eventually the Holy Spirit's gonna lead you to increase that, to increase it, to increase it, to increase it. And then eventually you'll be established as a man or a woman of prayer. Pastor Holden, when he heard Pastor Terry praying at Southwest Believers Convention, and he said, Lord, if you teach me to pray like that, I'll never go another day of my life without, without praying, without talking to you. He used to think that prayer was boring. But the Pastor Holden that you see now is here because his habits that he formed have established him. It's your choice. It's your fruit. It's your day. Miss Iva also has 24 hours in her day. It's true. Pastor George, the head pastor of EMIC and the CEO of Kenneth Copeland Ministries has 24 hours in his day. But he's the man that he is today because of the habits that he has established in his life. He's healthy because he goes to the gym three times a week. His son, Pastor Jeremy, was talking about that in one of the afternoon sessions. He said, yeah, my dad gets up three days a week and he goes to the gym, 6 a.m. And Pastor George is healthy and vibrant and full of youth. And that's amazing. He wouldn't be that way if he didn't establish that habit, right? but his habits have now established him as a healthy individual amongst pastor, father, grandfather, man of God, man of prayer, anointed leader, CEO, all of the things, Mr. Rogers <laughs> inside the vision, right? Like the list goes on, but that didn't happen overnight. And that didn't happen because he attended one Southwest Believers Convention. He talks about how Pastor Terry, when they met, she handed him like all of Brother Copeland's tapes because Brother Copeland sent them. But had he not listened to them, the fruit that you see today would not be here. He had to make that choice. We have the same choice. I'm gonna go to James chapter two. Y'all doing good? Praise the Lord. I love talking about Jesus. James chapter 2, verse 14. I do, do like chapter titles in your Bible ever make you laugh? They make me laugh sometimes because sometimes they're just so blunt. This one makes me laugh because it just is titled, Faith Without Works is Dead. Like, okay, here we go. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? In the same way, you can say all day, this is an orange tree, when there's no fruit on it. But if I tell a three-year-old that that's an orange tree, they're gonna be like, what are you talking about? That's not an orange tree, there's no oranges. There's no oranges. They're not going to be able to understand that. Same way, they're like, yeah, I got faith, I'm so generous. I'm established in generosity because I know that my motivation for accumulation is distribution. And then you're walking down the street and you just totally blow by that person asking you for food, right? It's like, oh, what have you? Have you established generosity in your life? My tithe 
is a custom in my life. It is a habit in my life. Every Thursday, when I get that paycheck, that's a habit for me. I don't do it because I have to. I do it because I love the Lord, but that's a habit that I have established in my life. It's a work. It's a fruit. When your heart is towards Jesus, you're going to produce real fruit. You're going to want to read the word. You're going to want to pray. You're going to want to be with him. But you have to have action. You have to have the works. The word says that faith alone, the belief alone, the desire alone, the want to alone is not enough. So you can be at Southwest all week and you say, I'm established. I want to walk with the Lord. I want to, I want to, I want to. But if you don't make the decision to go home and do something, you're going to be like that first tree with no fruit. But if you choose to start at your level, even if it's small, even if it's a verse a day, even if it's five minutes a day, even if it's, I'm going to start going to church every Sunday. I'm going to start going to youth every Wednesday. I'm going to start praying in tongues five minutes a day. Even if it's starting small, you're going to see the fruit. You are going to see the fruit. Say, I am, I am going, going to, see to see the fruit. The fruit. It's up to you to establish the habits in your life in order to produce the fruit that the Lord has intended for you to produce. Does that make sense? So establish your habits or your habits will establish you. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for listening, for receiving the word today, for being here, for being hungry. And if you have any questions about establishing habits in your life or how to do it, come talk to one of us and we will gladly give you some tips and some pointers because we love you and we are here for you. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you. Praise God. That was awesome. Establish your habits or they will establish you. Cool. All right, let's stand to our feet. Let's get out of here. Father, we thank you for these, for this session. We ask that you help us to water the seeds that were planted this afternoon. We thank you for um, just all that has taken place over these five days. And we just thank you that we're not done yet. So Lord, as the students go to um, have their break and have dinner with their families and their friends, that you would bless them, that you would keep them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Remember, if you were one of the 20 who signed up or who wanted to be in the synchronized swimming, um, like link up with your people before you leave so you guys can come up with a plan of if you're going to like meet like a few minutes early or something like that. Um, if you have questions or something, come holler at me. Um, all right. God loves you. We love you. Jesus is Lord.